Thank you. According to Cloud, started as well. Thank you. Backup is still rolling. Thank you and good morning. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Economic Development. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Committee on Economic Development, where today we will have oversight on life sciences in New York City. Let me welcome Council Members Koo, Powers, Cornegie, Lewis, and Lander, and I hope everyone had a wonderful weekend. We celebrated Juneteenth. We celebrated Father's Day. Got my Disney dad cup here. Life is good. Um, and we've got primary day tomorrow, so lots going on here in the city. So let's get through this great hearing and let's start it off. So good morning and welcome to today at City Council. Today is Monday, June 21st, 2021, first day of summer. My name is Paul Vallone and I have the privilege of chairing this committee. I'd like to extend my thanks to my fellow committee members and staff together to hold this important hearing as we follow up on life sciences in New York City. Um, this has been in the works for a little over four years and EDC's efforts in this project have already begun to bear fruit. Uh, we had this hearing not too long ago, and this is a good follow-up, especially on the timing of the mayor's new announcement. In the late 2016, Mayor de Blasio first announced a $500 million investment into the city's life sciences sector in order to generate an estimated 16,000 new jobs and to further cement New York's position as a global leader in life sciences research and innovation. The mayor dubbed this initiative LifeSci NYC and outlined a 10 point plan detailing how that 500 million would be spent, where the jobs would be created, and what sort of expectations the public should have for engagement with this new funding at the city's life sciences sector. The highlights of that plan include a borough spanning campus of life sciences institutions along Manhattan's east side that EDC is now calling LifeSci Avenue significant tax incentives to attract commercial laboratories to the city and various investments in nonprofits, incubators, startups, and innovation hubs, and a citywide paid internship program for life sciences at local colleges and universities, something that was dear to me at the first hearing, so I'm looking forward to an update on that. Thus far, the LifeSci NYC initiative seems to have delivered on most of its promises. The administration has highlighted that LifeSci NYC has attract, attracted over $1 billion in venture funding in 2020 alone, up from $130 million in 2016. This enabled the city to open 2 million square feet of new life sciences, innovation spaces, and has generated six new incubators, yielding roughly 150 startup companies every couple of years. The administration has also highlighted successes opening campuses and labs in partnership with several private developers and academic institutions across the city, including the Alexandria Center in Kipps Bay, the Cure Center on Parks Avenue, and the BioLabs at NYU in Soho. Conditional investments are underway at Columbia University, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Rockefeller University, and the New York Stem Cell Foundation, each of which will continue to grow the footprint of the life science sector in our city. Seeing how these investments were each announced within the last six months, we on the committee look forward to hearing updates on the progress of them today. Additionally, there was a $75 million investment in the NYC internship program, which was initially slated to create 1,000 paid summer internships for undergraduate and graduate students, uh, starting at $15 an hour. Thus far, it appears only 400 students have participated and received paid internships, so we look forward to hearing details from EDC today on how they plan to spread this great program, especially since I thought working with DOE and partnering with our students, knowing what jobs and, and careers are available right here as this grows, is paramount for the success of this initiative. Lastly, the mayor announced a doubling of the program earlier this month in the form of a plan to inject an additional $500 million into this life science sector to continue to build lab space, incubators, and support. We on the committee are very eager to hear the details of this new investment. Clearly, we're taking pride in, since we announced the hearing and there's another 500 million, it's all related, right? This has to be related. I'm committed to that. I look forward to hearing that testimony. Before we begin, I'd just like to formally congratulate 
EDC's new president and CEO, Rachel Loeb, who I had the pleasure of meeting and doing the groundbreaking at Bullets Point last week on her new position and her amazing staff, which we've worked so well with over the last four years. We look forward to having several productive hearings with you during our final six months of the council session. With that, I'd like to thank the Economic Development Committee staff, our amazing legislative council, Alex Polinoff, our amazing policy analyst, Emily Forgione, and our amazing finance analyst, Aliyah Ali, for all their hard work putting this hearing together and staying with me and the team from day one. With that said, I would now turn it over to our moderator, committee counsel, and it's happy with his Father's Day, Alex Polinoff, to go over some of the procedural items. Thank you, Chair Alon. It was a great Father's Day. Yes. <laughs> I am Alex Polinoff, counsel to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council. Uh, before we begin testimony, I'd just like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you were called upon to testify at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the question and answer portion of the administration's testimony. I will be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be Susan Rosenthal, the Senior Vice President of Life Sciences and Healthcare at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Carlo Ubienko, EDC's Vice President of Life Sciences and Healthcare, will also be available for questioning. I will call on each of you shortly for the oath, and then again when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call upon you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. Please note that for the ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the close of the hearing. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. To all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will read the oath and then call on each of you individually for a response. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Senior Vice President Rosenthal? I do. Vice I President Ivienko? I do. Thank you both. Senior Vice President Rosenthal, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. We've also been joined by Council Member Barron. Sorry, Susan, just wanted to make sure she was acknowledged. No worries. Um, good morning, Chair Vallone and members of the Economic Development Committee. I'm Susan Rosenthal, and I have the pleasure of serving as Senior Vice President of Life Sciences and Healthcare at New York City Economic Development Corporation. With me is Dr. Carlo Uvienko, our Vice President of Life Sciences and Healthcare. I'm pleased and proud to be here to discuss LifeSci NYC, an initiative led by New York City Economic Development Corporation. We launched LifeSci NYC in 2016 to invest in life sciences research, development, and related innovation. Today, I will lay out the initiative's accomplishments to date, our important pandemic response efforts, and the plans for fi the $500 million investment recently announced in the mayor's executive budget for LifeSci NYC, bringing the city's total commitment to $1 billion. Life sciences is coming of age in New York City. Not long ago, we couldn't name a handful of New York City-based life sci companies, and now we have hundreds. My testimony will detail the story of life sciences here, its foundation, its rapid growth through our investment, and our exciting future. First of all, what are life sciences in this context? We say life sciences are the combined applications of biology and technology for the advancement of humanity. Sounds like a lofty goal, but really it's a practical one taking biology research and putting its outcomes to use. In this definition, the word applications encompasses both the applied research activities within our academic institutions, as well as the commercial activities of large and small companies. The foundational research can be used in health or non-health applications. In non-health, it can be used in consumer goods and foods, in agriculture and industrial chemicals. In health, put simply, think medicines, diagnostics, medical devices, and vaccines. None of this is new to New York City. For decades, we've had many of the essential building blocks for a thriving life sciences ecosystem. Our advantages include an array of teaching hospitals, research facilities, universities, researchers and scientists, technicians, students, Nobel laureates, clinicians, and one of the world's largest city public health care systems. 
Maybe you didn't know this, but New York has among the world one of the highest concentrations of Nobel Prizes attributed to its academic institutions. This remarkable science spans from chemistry to physics to medicine. And along with them, we have a deep and diverse talent pool with all levels of necessary skills. Every year, 7,000 graduate students and postdocs in the life sciences study at premier academic and medical institutions, including nine academic medical centers. These world-class programs bring hundreds of years of experience and knowledge to the global scientific community. And we'd like to keep that knowledge here. Beyond investments in new labs and office space, we're investing directly in talent. More than 400 undergraduate and graduate interns have been placed across over 100 host companies. In previous years, 47% of those internships have either been extended or transformed into full-time roles. This five-year-old program supports NYC EDC's commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Interns hail from every borough and a majority identify as Black, Asian, or Latino. In addition, over a half million healthcare workers make their living within the five boroughs. Our extensive healthcare system includes over 50 hospitals and 370 federally qualified healthcare centers. On top of that, 100 disease specialty foundations drive research and advocacy for patients. Together, these ingredients position New York City to take a leading role to advance the fundamental understanding of disease, develop cures, and deliver treatment from discovery by bench scientists and innovators to patient care in our hospitals. We wanna make sure that that science starts here and stays here. In recent years, New York City has experienced early growth in life sciences. We've unlocked 2 million square feet of new life sciences innovation space, funded research at our major academic institutions, and seen the growth of six incubators generating hundreds of companies. As part of that, NYC EDC established key early partnerships prior to the 2016 commitment to LifeSci NYC. And let's take a look at some of them. The Alexandria Center for Life Science on Manhattan's east side is home to a diverse range of high quality life sciences entities. They include multinational pharmaceutical firms, as well as early stage and growth stage companies. Harlem Biospace is one of the city's first biotech incubators to offer affordable shared wet lab space for competitively selected entrants. And Brooklyn's Biobat offers research and manufacturing space to biotechnology and related companies, as well as work opportunities for SUNY downstate scientists, clinicians, and, sci and students. In addition to these early efforts, NYC EDC wanted to better understand how to, how to bolster growth and position New York City as a global center of innovation in life sciences. We conducted fundamental research into the field to learn what can be further accomplished. And our findings helped lay the groundwork for the first $500 million for LifeSci NYC, which included $150 million in city capital to support nonprofit R&D facilities to spur new research that translates to companies, jobs, and medicines. $300 million in city investments to seed the construction of needed commercial lab space and incubators, and $50 million dedicated to investments in talent and early stage companies. In 2017, we established an advisory council to provide leadership and strategic direction. The council is comprised of leaders spanning academia, the venture community, and industry. It's co-chaired by Dr. Harold Varmus, professor of medicine of the Weill Medical College of Cornell University, and Dr. Vicky Sato, chairman of the board of Veer Biotechnology. Under the council's leadership, we opened Biolabs at NYU Langone, a premier co-working space for startups to test, develop, and grow innovative ideas. Biolabs offers exclusive events, programming, and activities to connect startups with industry partners. The facility can hold up to 35 companies at a time. Among those which located their startups at Biolabs and recently shared their expanding to larger spaces in New York City are C16 Biosciences, a female-led company that manufactures environmentally friendly synthetic palm oil, and Immuni, which maps the immune system for better medicine development. Through LifeSci NYC, we've also offered city investments to create new wet lab capable space and incubators at Deerfield Management's Cure. It's where innovators from across the industry and around the world can work in a collaborative atmosphere. I just wanna pause for a moment and recognize the crisis we've all lived through. As you can imagine, we can't talk about the importance of life sciences without talking about COVID-19 and the pandemic that swept the world. As we all know, New York City was hit early and hit hard, but the pandemic showed the world the potential of our robust life sciences industry. Together, we mobilized resources to help New Yorkers through one of the most severe crises our city has ever faced. NYC EDC played an important role helping the city overcome early shortages of personal protective equipment. We leveraged our relationships in the advanced manufacturing, life sciences, and fashion industries to help quickly pivot businesses to create much needed gowns, face shields, and test kits. One of our biggest challenges was to help address the shortage of life-saving ventilators. 
we convened a partnership with researchers, local innovators, and members of the medical and public health communities to develop a bridge ventilator called the Spira Wave. And we did that in less than a month. The manufacture of COVID testing kits was another challenge, which EDC also helped overcome. With the assistance of experts across the country, local medical professionals, professionals and city agencies, we refined the process and quickly found local manufacturers to go into production. These efforts ultimately produced 1.25 million test kits for use at New York City health and hospitals and community testing sites, as well as other sites within the city's test and trace program. Knowing how critical testing would be to the health and economy of New York, in September, we also partnered with a Brooklyn-based company called Opentrons to launch the Pandemic Response Lab. It's consistently delivered COVID-19 test results in under 24 hours at a cost-effective $28 per test. Ultimately, the lab grew to process at least 40,000 tests per day. And to activate more testing innovation for quick results and to support New York City's access to rapid tests, we created the Rapid Testing Innovation Competition. And from that, we awarded $164,000 to Columbia University to Dr. David Ho's lab to support studies to accelerate the deployment of its CoScan rapid test. Even in the midst of the chaos of COVID, we knew we could not just concentrate on emergency response we needed to focus on the future for New York City as well. So we did. In December, we announced the establishment of the Pandemic Response Institute. Its mission is to better prepare the city for future health emergencies and pandemics. It will help position the city as a leader in public health research and innovation. These efforts will not only improve New York City's health infrastructure, but serve as a blueprint for the rest of the country and perhaps the world. Despite the pandemic, or maybe because of it, funding for life sciences companies reached new levels. NIH funding and venture investment has reached new heights for New York City this past year. And now over 2 million square feet of new life sciences spaces are anticipated to come online by the end of this year, a total of over 3 million square feet by 2023. This acceleration illustrates New York City's unprecedented opportunity to create, produce, and deliver medical breakthroughs and generate thousands of jobs for New Yorkers, making our city a healthier and fairer place to live and work. So what's next? The plan for the next half billion dollars calls for over $200 million in city financial investment and $300 million in city capital. It includes an expansion fund to invest in companies growing into wet lab spaces from universities or incubators, and it further extends the LifeSci NYC internship program. We expect this total $1 billion investment to create 40,000 jobs. So whether someone's beginning their career, starting with an idea, expanding a company, or planning its next phase of growth, we want to encourage them to do it here in New York City. Mayor de Blasio kicked off this next chapter of LifeSci NYC by announcing the Life Sciences Innovation Infrastructure RFP. Its focus is to help advance the commercial research and development of new medicines, medical di devices, diagnostics, and research tools. Selected projects will receive an award of up to $20 million. Currently, the heart of the New York City Life Sciences ecosystem is what's been called LifeSci Avenue, the established industry corridor along the east side of Manhattan. The stretch encompasses some of the country's premier institutions in biomedical research, clinical care, and commercial biotech. This new investment will support this existing industry corridor and strengthen the development of other life sciences clusters in neighborhoods around the city. This will contribute to a greater ecosystem and the dissemination of career building jobs. Manhattan's West Side is already home to multiple life sciences incubators and leading institutions. It's home to newer hubs like the Hudson Research Center in Midtown and the Tasty Lab building in the Manhattanville factory district further uptown. But there are important clusters in other boroughs too. In Morris Park, in the Bronx, the Einstein Montefiore Biotechnology Accelerated Research Center, also known as Embark, will anchor a growing life sciences ecosystem with a new biomanufacturing facility. Embark will accelerate the growth of New York City companies by providing cells and proteins critical to commercializing patient therapies. In Long Island City, Queens, Alexandria's Bindery is unlocking growth stage lab and office space in a mixed use neighborhood with a rich history of innovation. On the Brooklyn waterfront, the core of the borough's growing biotech community is coming together and expanding. It's defined by early stage company, includes an established manufacturing base, some of it at the Brooklyn Navy, Navy Yard and the Brooklyn Army Terminal, and anchored by SUNY Downstate's Advanced Biotechnology Incubator. To build this hardy life sciences ecosystem, we need companies and founders to be believers too. Just last week, we sponsored the global marketplace at the International Bio Conference which brings together industry giants and startups alike. This is just one step in a business attraction plan that's well underway. It's what EDC does, helps business form or come to New York, stay in New York and thrive in New York, all to help build a better, stronger and more diversified economy. 
Through the city's landmark $1 billion total investment in LifeSign YC, we're committed to early stage discoveries, further development of life scientist spaces, more equitable health outcomes for communities, and supporting a valuable jobs pipeline to add to a stronger recovery for all. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I now welcome any questions you have. Thank you, Susan, and to your entire team. There's a lot in there. Yes. <laughs> we could spend a, a week on each one of those. Uh, I have to say, if we didn't, if, if this didn't start in 2016, I think we would have had a very different response to the pandemic. I think the critical beginning of this program back in 2016, 2017, put the footprint in place to quickly pivot when we could. Uh, and I think that's why we saw it. That's why EDC plays such a lead role in those survival beginning days and weeks. And I thank your team for that. Um, and for the council members that are on, I know this is a very busy day, especially what's happening tomorrow. So any question that you want or want, you just will jump in at any time. I see council member Cornegy, my brother's got a very busy uh, 48 hours on his plate. So Robert, if you wanted to ask your question, now, so we can get you on your way, I'd be happy to do that. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Um, and thank you uh, for this, this, this tremendous testimony. Um, I think the concern has been in communities that are ancillary to Manhattan, uh, that these jobs that are going to be created, which are fantastic jobs, pipeline to, um, to the middle class and upper middle class. Uh, and while we, I, I just wanna know if there's a curriculum in place that reaches back into our high schools and junior high schools as we set up this system and that all of the growth that we see take place is not accessed by uh, uh, people who we have to import in to meet these jobs. There's a pipeline that we could create and I'm hoping that we'll consider that. So the, the, the jobs and the economic development and our being at the forefront uh, of this industry, I think is incredibly important. It signifies who New York is and how we truly recover, but without a pathway for everyone to participate in this, uh, over the next years as attrition takes place in these jobs is going to be important. So is there a tie, uh, I didn't hear mentioned, is there a tie directly to curriculums that are, are, are a part of our school system, uh, not just the colleges, but the high schools putting our young people on a path to these jobs of the future? Thank you, Councilmember Cornegie. It's, it's a, a really important question um, and one that I'm, I'm happy to share some insight into uh, and something that we're going to be working on over time as, as the LifeSci NYC initiative unfolds. Um, so a couple of, of thoughts. Um, the, the first is that talent is, is uh, incredibly important to this initiative. And so we will continue to invest in talent programs um, as part of the broader Life Science NYC initiative. Um, part of that is through some of the financial support that we bring forward, we will be working with operators on considering programming um, in, in the STEM space, whether that's at uh, like our internships program, um, or for more K through 12 um, opportunities, we will, we will consider those. Um, at this time, we are focused on, on uh, both our internships program um, and on programs like that, where we take the, as we're setting up um, different campuses, we're thinking about how do we then include uh, programming with those operators for earlier STEM education. Uh, thank you. Thank you. What I'll do is follow up on that, Robert, because that's, I mean, I, you know, I'm going to ask on questions on the students. For me, probably the greatest part of these last eight years was incorporating our children into their careers and futures here in the city. So this is a perfect opportunity. Um, and I think you have two kind of segments here, right? You had the first initial $500 million investment, and now we have the announcement of the second, which I know is, is more of a futuristic. But Susan, maybe you could tell us on, on the successes of the first capital investments. You outlined uh, the first 500 million investment in your testimony. You said uh, unlocking 2 million square feet, funded research labs, six incubators. Uh, for those who didn't have access to, you also had a, a, like a slide there on where that was. Could you run us through, since we are five boroughs and we are always advocating for our districts and the outer boroughs also, how that that those capital investments look at the five boroughs or you link the city together within the investments. And then secondly, take that to how are we developing our children, our students in high school and college to be knowledgeable of the internships and where are they coming? 
Sure. Um, so first, let me start by saying how grateful we are to the city for the initial investment of the $500 million back in 2016, as well as the expansion to a billion dollars. Um, and um, just to share, I'll run through very quickly some of the, the broader successes and highlight um, where they are across the five boroughs. Um, and, and, and then I'll give a little more detail into um, your second question. So um, the Life MIC uh, program has successfully launched or invested in several projects um, and, and in both infrastructure and the talent needed in New York City based on that initial 2016 vision. Um, that included an incubator at Biolabs at NYU Langone, um, which is, as mentioned earlier, in Soho. Um, we've also invested in commercial lab and incubator space um, with The Cure and, and, and in Inolabs in Long Island City. Um, we also have the LifeSci Internship Program, as you know, which um, is, is accessed across all five boroughs um, and is predominantly um, used uh, predominantly used by people of color, as well as uh, almost uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent uh, of students come from CUNY and SUNY. Um, so, so let's just stay with that. So how, how are we? How do we know that? Where are those students coming from, and, and how are we drawing those uh, that pathway and that that career path for students and city schools to know of these opportunities within life science? What what exact EDC project? How are we coming up with those numbers, and where are these students coming from? So EDC has an operator that manages the internship program, and that operator. Um, starts very early in the fall working with all of the schools across the city um, to go through a promotional effort to make sure that students are aware of the internship program and that there are sessions to learn about it, uh, to learn about the process to apply, as well as um, learn about what the expectations of uh, the interns are uh, as well. Um, and so that operator canvases across the city and also hosts um, sessions virtual. This past year has been entirely virtual. Um, to make sure that, that that is accessible to students across all five boroughs. Um, and one, one actually suggestion and, and question I have back to the, the council members um, is that if there are ways that we can further support gaining ask, access to the internship program for your constituents, we'd welcome reaching out and partnering with you to, to help do that. Well, I mean, right off the bat, I, I, I don't, I haven't had any contact with the operator, whoever the person is that's running the programs. And, you know, I was one of the ones that were advocating to make sure our students have that. This, like Council Member Cornegie, and I see Council Member Barron, I see your hand up, so I'll get right to you. Um, good morning, by the way. <laughs> uh, this is one of those really jewels. I mean, this is these are great jobs that are a good paying pathway to bringing us to that to the middle class and beyond. Um, and, and I think you even stated it's a projection of maybe 40,000 jobs. So mm -hmm. the the capital investments there, the success is clearly there. Uh, and I know uh, we'll, we'll get a chance and pivot back to what you think some of the great successes are and then how we were able to pivot to the pandemic for that. But um, I, I think there is the incorporation between our, our great school districts, private and public. Um, there can definitely be a quick way with fall around the corner uh, to, to let our students know and probably a little bit better that this pathway and how you can obtain these type of careers through these incubator programs and through the capital investments and the RFPs that are coming out. Um, I think we could probably team up with the operator, whatever crew that's doing that. You have over 50 council members would be very happy to spread that word and link that information and get these, these students that opportunity because in a, I guess we're a post pandemic world, but we're still just coming out of it job creation, small business creation, this and this type of investment, it's huge, you're talking about a billion dollars, um, is a direct link to bring that. So I, I, I think we could probably do a little better job there. Um, I'd be happy to work with spreading that word. I know my, my the high schools and the colleges and the students would be would eat this opportunity. Okay, that sounds great, Chair Vallone. We'd love to be in touch with you about that. Uh, Councilmember Barron, I know you've got your hand up, so let's let's turn the floor over, Councilmember. Time starts now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the chair, and thank you for the uh, presentation. Just a couple of, I guess, very targeted questions. How many students? When did the program begin? Uh, the program began five years ago. Okay. How many students the have the, the announcement? Okay. How many students have applied? 
or what's the average per year? I guess it's grown, the applications I would imagine have grown since better knowledge, greater knowledge of the program has been uh, shared. So um, the, the great news is that thousands, well, I mean, thousands of students apply for the program every year. Um, and I would say somewhere between one and 2000 students each year. Um, it really is a mix of um, how many students apply as well as the roles that are open uh, from host companies. And so we have, um, we've had a goal and actually Chair Valone, this is also to help clarify from um, your, your initial opener about the internships program. We have a goal of 1000 interns over 10 years. So that's the goal, a goal of 100 interns per year. Um, and over the past um, four years, we've had um, one, uh, we've had, we've reached over 400 interns. And so we are um, achieving that goal and then some, and we're really thrilled um, that we have this, this continued funding to support uh, the ongoing program as well as potentially expanding it. So with this expansion, uh, the increase that you're getting uh, for the new year coming up, do you intend to expand the number of participants you have? Do you, you're getting double the money. Do you plan to double the number of participants? Well, so let's clarify a little bit in terms of the source of funding. So from the um, expanded funding for LifeSci NYC, $10 million of that expanded funding is operating expenses. Of that, half of it over the course of four years will be used to support the internship program. Um, and so that is expanded funding for the internship program, but it's not, uh, the, the full billion dollars is not expense money, that, that it's different sources of, uh, of funding. And so with that expansion, we're working with Upper West Strategies, which is the operator I mentioned earlier, um, to look into what that expansion could be for the coming year. So you don't yet have a targeted number uh, of applicants or participants that will be expected based on this expansion? No, I, we I, at this I, time. I would we need like to, to work get that. some kind of gauge, you know, we're doubling the money, but we're only seeing a what, 5%, 10%, 10%, 50% increase in the number of students. And as we know, the objective is to actually reach the students mm -hmm. and provide them with that. So I'd like to see if we can't get that number presented to us so we'll know exactly uh, how it has expanded. And sure. you mentioned how many host companies do you have? Well, we over the course of the four years, we've had over 100 host companies. Okay. And how many have remained over a period of multiple years? Do they come in one year and then they move out? Or do they have some longevity with the program? Many of them are, are continued partners and continue to take interns year over year. Um, some of them it, uh, have not, but the majority have stayed with us. Um, I would request uh, to follow up with you on that, that data. Um, because it is, it does require a little extra precision from what I what I know off the top of my head. And do you ask them why they're no longer participating? Do we have an idea as to what are the reasons that they don't continue to participate? Uh, we might be something that. that might be offered or adjusted that would uh, make it more enticing for them to continue. So um, we'll look into that. I will share that as part of our funding mechanism. Um, we have a mix of companies that are at different stages of their own uh, growth. And so we don't want um, to, to have companies feel that they cannot participate in the internship program because they are limited in their own financial funding. Right. And so as part of the, the funding that we've asked for for the internship program, it actually goes towards stipends um, for the interns uh, to be paid um, because we feel it's critical to make sure they, these opportunities are available uh, we also feel it's it's um, required or, or critical to make sure those interns are paid. And what's the average amount of the stipend that the interns receive? Uh, I would have to look into that to follow up. Okay. And do you have any disaggregated information as to the ethnicity of those who are participating in your program? Yes. So to date, 16% um, of them are uh, Black, 14% are Latino. Um, 25% are white and the rest are either Asian or uh, have, or have uh, answered that they are more than one race. Time expired. Okay, thank you. Just uh, briefly wrap up if I may, Mr. Chair. Of course. Thank you. Um, I would like to know the numbers of participants, how that reflects on the totality of students who did apply. 
So you have 16% Black that you say were participants. I'd like to get an idea. Does that reflect the number of the applicants? Is there some correlation between that? Mm, we, I, we can look into that. That's a really interesting question that I would love to also answer with you. Okay, great. And I, I want to echo what my colleague has said in terms of not just targeting the college level, but looking to see how we can make sure that our high school students are also aware, involved, and encouraged to participate in to the degree that they can. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me the extra time, and thank you to uh, the presentation. Certainly. Thank you. So Susan, let's pivot from the internships to actual employment and job numbers. So with the initial investment, um, you know, there were some lofty numbers of like, I think expecting 40,000 jobs or so. Can, can you identify um, how many jobs were created or what type of pipeline we can expect from, from the original program? Sure, so um, the original program, as you mentioned earlier, um, led to the, the projections of 16,000 jobs um, over the course of 10 years. Um, and of that initial $500 million in investment, to date, uh, 192 of it has been uh, contracted and committed, um, and we've forecasted 3,458 jobs um, as a result. Um, the rest of the funding uh, to reach that initial $500 million, we have visibility to either in the form of RFPs or that are, are out now, um, or have potential pipeline for um, IDA funding that are that go along with them. So we would anticipate um, the delivery of the remaining of the portfolio and that pipeline of jobs in, in the future. So what are some of the um, RFPs that you're excited about that are that are out there now? And is there is there any opportunity now for, for those RFPs still continuing or are the others still coming? Yes, so um, there are a few RFPs that are outstanding uh, and they're outstanding not just because they're out and about, but because they are fantastic. Um, the first one is the Life Sciences Innovation Infrastructure RFP that was announced um, as part of this expanded uh, announcement a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that, uh, for that, in a moment, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Carlo Uvienko to share more about it. He's been leading this effort and has been instrumental in standing up this RFP. Um, we also have uh, the Pandemic Response Institute RFP that's open now um, that we are thrilled to, to really be setting up the city for future public health emergencies um, and connecting um, with the different agencies and with the private sector in a, in a more robust way moving forward. And we anticipate making an award uh, for that, that Pandemic Response Institute um, towards the end of the summer. Um, in addition to that, our IDA program remains open and we hope and see visibility to a pipeline of developers um, that are hoping to put in place additional campuses and incubators uh, for the life sciences industry. Uh, Carla, would you like to add a little bit more about the Infrastructure Innovation RFP? Yeah, and, and if you could, that those are two great points there. I mean, that, that RFP for additional campus space is something that I think each of the council members, if, if we can identify a five borough approach to that, that would really be able to link the hub and the new avenue that's in Manhattan with, with the, you know, let's say out of boroughs, but every borough is an out of borough, um, to the success of that growth of it. I think that would really bring the four of the boroughs to Manhattan to that. And, and the second part would be um, with those with those RFPs, are, are nonprofits able to bid on that? And how is that working? Yeah, so do you uh, want to start and I'll, I'll follow up? Sure. Thanks, Sue. And, and thanks, council members. Um, so just to set a little bit of context in terms of the RFP that's out right now pertaining to city capital and the life sciences innovation infrastructure RFP, this is somewhat related to our 2008 RFP entitled the Applied R&D Facilities Request for Proposals. And that was specifically to fund the establishment of specialized infrastructure projects that would help advance commercial research and development into new therapeutics of medicines. And um, as a reminder to folks that this being for city capital, it was restricted to not-for-profits. It's actually geared towards um, only not-for-profits uh, but that could be in, a, in, a, in the form of a joint venture or partnerships with for-profit entities. Um, as was indicated in the, the January announcement, we issued out four awards for 38 million across those nonprofit institutions. This one that's out now that we released earlier this month will specialize similarly in infrastructure projects to help commercial R&D in the life sciences, uh, but specifically uh, expanding the scope of 
what can be accomplished beyond therapies and medicines. If anything, um, COVID has impressed upon us that it takes more than a breakthrough medicine to answer the call of a pandemic or a disease or a plague. And, and, and in this case, uh, we are expanding the scope to include medical device development, diagnostics, um, research tools, and, and also biomaterials, where we're seeing a lot of activity in uh, the life sciences right now and, and dovetails very nicely with New York City's incumbent strengths in design and, and fashion. And so that's, that's sort of the general gist of the, the, the RFP that's out right now. And that is uh, capped at $20 million per award and will be accessing the pool of an original 150 million in city capital from the 2016 announcement and whatever's left over after the 38 million that we've contingently awarded in January. Um, and so then, Carlo, how do you see that vision? How do you see that vision of those RFPs breaking out? Is, is that gonna be new locations, expansion of existing locations, um, growth on the success of the previous? Are we looking to get, uh, like you said, post pandemic, we have a different view on things, on, on the type of careers and possibilities and technologies. How do you see that breaking? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very exciting time for this particular RFP because the, New York City life sciences is in its, its infancy. And so with every year, it's, it's, a, it's an entirely new landscape that we get to calibrate to and, and, and leverage. And so when we re release that first RFP, the footprint of life sciences, as has been already alluded to on this, on this meeting, uh, really existed along the life sciences corridors and around the existing academic institution. But even in just three years, what we've seen is a pop-up of both private and um, public-private real estate development in um, both um, other neighborhoods within Manhattan, but also in the outer boroughs, in the Bronx and in Long Island City. Uh, name to how do we how do we integrate that? You know, I think so, you can hear from the council members like maybe there's even a lack of uh knowledge of, of what's happening within the outer boroughs within this new sector that's linking together in this one title of life science it, it's wonderful in its growth but it's also a little bit foreign to the to the to current landscape of how the city's working with its employment yeah our hope is, is that with this rfp and also other types of procurement that we will be able to enable the the continued seeding of those new neighborhoods with the type of capital infrastructure that they need to connect, for example, academic researchers that are on the, the bleeding edge of, of starting companies and, and commercializing technologies to have them to have a presence uh, in those new clusters. And so that it's, it sort of um, shares the wealth, if you will, of not just the, the, the capital and the infrastructure, but also the intellectual capacity of our, our great institutions. And so that one to two billion dollars of NIH funding that everyone touts and sort of the question mark of why it's not unlocking more commercial ventures, having that to have a footprint of activity in those outer boroughs. That's our hope with this RFP and also other types of strategic. Initiatives. You know what, and if I may, I could just give you a real quick on how it goes from macro to micro. So you, you have, and I know what happens in our district, we have uh, of schools that are, are desperate for after school programs for their students. We call them CASA programs and we link up with some of the larger institutions and some of the smaller nonprofit. Mm. With that type of capital investment, you, you can build in a automatic almost after school program with the lower schools from high schools into colleges so that in the areas where you foresee some of the growth that they're, the students and the pathway to these jobs are from day one. And sometimes what we do is we miss that opportunity. It takes years before we link up a school with this new industry. And, and this is something that I'm saying, it's not just quote internships or jobs, there's a way to, because it's so new, it, there's not many this excitement of that we can create a brand new investment post pandemic that's so needed from day one, because we've already done it with other after school CASA programs and college programs and, and getting kids right in from day one with these new companies and the new FRPs that it would it, just be my advice that, that it's using the success of previous type of programs. With this, we don't need to like find another 25,000 from any particular council member or something. We could just be built right in with our colleges, with our CUNYs, with our high school, with that area. And you will have an amazing buzz from the students to know that they're getting into this in this 
new opportunities post pandemic that the city is right on it. You know, that I, I'm excited for this, but it's, it's, you know, like one step away from linking it all together as the speed of this is happening. Um, mm -hmm. I think you can tap well, into some of these, the, the, you know, I, I'm not just speaking for myself. There's a lot of excitement out there with each of the council members of districts, the school district parents, they're asking, where do our kids go now in this new virtual, new educational world? Uh, and here we have it. You know, you're, you're Carlo and Susan, you're, you're outlining this exciting new capital investments and careers and jobs. So it's just a matter of kind of bringing it down from whatever, quote, operator is doing that to, to really linking it down to, to an educational. You'd have a pipeline there. I don't, I don't know if we'd want to chime in on those thoughts, but I think that's kind of what I would foresee that next step to be. Yeah, Chair I think Malone, that's, oh, go ahead, Sue. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I feel you have an honorary seat on our project teams. <laughs> I'm in. Um, we're going to have some time on my hands. You know, we, we, every project, uh, we, we shifted over the, the, the past couple of years that every project we do is, is more than a building, is more than the space. Every project we do has to have uh, programming that goes with it and talent development that goes with it. And so um, I'm going to use an example, um, which doesn't touch on K through 12 programming at this very moment, but in the future could. Um, our, our partnership with Deerfield Management for Cure at 345 Park Avenue South, we actually have a collaboration with Deerfield um, on talent programming that has specific funding for talent programming. Um, and I'll, I'll share a great example um, that, that took place over this past year. Um, Deerfield launched a program called the Exceed Award. Um, and that award is for seed funding for uh, women and minority founders um, to help catalyze their, their uh, business forward. Um, and they awarded five businesses, uh, five startups, um, $100,000 each to support the, the growth of their business this past March. Um, that's that's exactly, I think that's exactly what Council Member Barron was alluding to, too. That's a, it's, it's, it's linking it to small business and startups and careers and every mm -hmm. other group and every neighborhood. And that's a perfect example. Great. And so we will do that. Uh, it's, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we are baking in those talent programs and um, setting up the next generation for using those spaces for starting their companies and taking their ideas and their science forward. And I, and I think Susan, now putting my parent hat on, I, I think there's another opportunity to get that information out to New York families yes. citizens to let them know, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of, I don't, fear is not the right word. I guess it's just, we're all re-educating ourselves in the post-pandemic world. And mm -hmm. I have two kids coming out of college. I have a little one down in grammar school. And they do ask that very difficult question to the parents, what do we do now? So, you know, the career they may have thought they were going for is now kind of shifted and changed and the job market's changed. So this is the type of light that, that post-pandemic that, that kids can wrap their hands around and say, that's what I want to do for that. And how do I do it? And that's what I think we're missing. While we're launching this, I think there's a larger uh, message that can come from it. And I think that's where we can tap into. You don't need to, you guys never do, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel. You already have that in place. It's just using those resources to let the, the school districts know, let the parents know, let the colleges and CUNYs know. This is what's coming in, in this life science one billion, you know, half a million of it's 500 million has been done, new 500 million. And this is how, if you're interested, you can get into that because the job is waiting for you. It literally is. Well, yeah. and if I could share two, two responses to that, the first is um, you're absolutely right. Uh, if you ask the average New Yorker about life sciences, they would say, I don't know what that is. And so we have some work ahead of us to make sure that uh, New York City knows what life sciences is and that, that there's something there for them. Um, and I hope that you'll share with uh, your children that they have many opportunities ahead because the city has so many great building blocks in life sciences and we are creating those opportunities for them uh, when, they, when they grow up and, and choose what to do with their career. Um, it's something that they should be really excited and look forward to, to being part of. I think that's part of the challenge post today on how we spend these last six months together and hopefully, you know, Council Member Barron had one last question that I thought is relevant to this exact, you know, how do we know the next administration, the next council will continue this type of path? So is any of this going to be baseline? 
Is there any that's going to be included into the budget that will survive us and the crew that's on here? Well, my understanding uh, is that with the with OMB, we have this was declared as part of the city's budget, and so. Um, the city capital and the financial support and the operating expenses have been captured in the city budget to date. We can certainly follow up to make sure uh, and confirm that um, that is in, in the book or post this administration. Um, I would also hope that having been through the past 15, 16 months together, um, that the next administration would also see the importance both of the industry for helping prep and be and get through something like COVID-19 but also the resiliency that it brought forward. Um, ultimately, investing in life sciences is really about investing in a healthier and a stronger New York City. So I guess, Carlos and Susan, I, 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 I don't see Peter Ku with his hand up or any of the council members. If I do see another council member's hand pop up, I'll, I'll change. So I'm just continuing on unless someone else has a question. Um, wait, raise hand. Oh, Council Member Barrett. Inez, you want to follow up? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Uh, just as a quick question, I, I'm glad that you asked that question because we want to make sure that we don't, we're not at the mercy or the whims of others who may be coming behind to uh, pick at this project or not see the importance or elevate it to the status that it needs. And back to my other question about the data that shows us the ethnicity, I would also like to know the breakdown by boroughs for children who apply. Uh, because we say it's based basically in Manhattan and Long Island City. And we want to make sure that as we're getting the word out about the spread, that the other boroughs are also aware that it's not just restricted to those uh, coasts and partners that are in, in the city and in Long Island, Long Island City. Okay, um, thank you, Council Member Barron. Can you clarify your question uh, when you say the data, the data about the regarding internships the program? children? Yes, regarding the internship, the data for the applicants, uh, I'd like to have it also disaggregated by borough. I had okay. asked for ethnicity, but I'd like to also know by borough. Got it. Okay, well, I, I do know, I can share off the top of my head, uh, slash in my notes on, on my right, um, uh, of the current, of the internships to date, um, mm -hmm. 9% of them have been for students in Manhattan, 29% have been in Queens, 22% have, have been in Brooklyn, 9% have been in the Bronx, and the remainder are in Staten Island. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Yeah, that, and your work with students in education is, is something that's going to be a legacy for many Council Members to come, you and your husband. Uh, I think we, our two families have served quite a long time together. Uh, and that, that we could be proud looking back on that. So with, I guess for, for the team that's there, how, how did you see uh, with the new investment that are being made and committed, which are wonderful, it also comes after we have coming out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So how did this shift, I guess, from the original 500 million in your eyes become in a, in a post pandemic world that we can most utilize those new investments? Um, so, I will say with an immense amount of pride that uh, unfortunately the pandemic showed the value of this industry. Um, there, the, it was such a hard time and, and um, we really got through it by having many industry partners come together, whether that was in diagnostics or in vaccines or in the therapeutics that would be uh, used to either treat COVID or to treat the effects of COVID. Um, and we learned a couple of things over the past few years, even, even before the pandemic, as we were learning as life sciences was evolving. Um, the first is that there, there are um, opportunities to be had for clusters across the city um, that we will, as mentioned earlier, um, support the, the expansion of clusters that exist either on LifeSci Avenue or on the west side, but also um, putting in place investment in, um, in Brooklyn and Queens, in the Bronx, et cetera. Um, and so that's really important to us to make sure that, that the opportunity to develop and, and grow in life science is happening across the five boroughs. Um, the second uh, learning that, that uh, is really an evolution of the industry over, over the past several years um, is um, coming back to that definition of life sciences. Um, I mentioned it, it's really the intersection of biology and technology. Um, and we're seeing um, that grow and expand in definition more so every day, whether that's in bioinformatics, which is 
um, the study of DNA and RNA and, and the use of technology with that data, um, or um, in the use of technology in, uh, in, I'll use the example of Opentrons, which is a robotics company that helped us build the pandemic response lab. So using technology um, to develop new therapies, new, um, new technologies themselves, um, to expand the use of biology and deploy that, whether in the use of therapeutics or um, the more technical nature of devices and robotics, but also the adjacent industries that could be the food industry, that could be the uh, energy industry. Um, there are many different applications that biology has and our great universities are studying these things and we now want to make sure we are expanding the effort um, to accelerate that growth for New York City and bring that opportunity and keep it here. You know, it just, it's funny, as you mentioned, uh, robotics and with the students, I have a group called the Robo Pandas out, out in TS-94, right as far as you can go before you get to Nassau County. And they do this great citywide competition with uh, uh, Legos and mm, robotronics, and they put these things, but it's really based on a format from maybe like 10, 20 years ago. Right. This would be a perfect new you could create this new maybe next year, give those groups of citywide groups that compete on that robotronic panel to see what they come up with on this new life science course, where they can now take something that they've been working on for years and gear it to this new technology. Like I say, it, it's always connected. And, and it, it, you have these kids that are in the sixth, seventh and eighth grade already thinking about futuristic with Legos and robots and combining the two and how they can do a, a biodome or something new. They're all, they're amazing. Every year they invite me out to, to judge on it. And I hate it because they all look like winners to me, <laughs> but huh. uh, it's, a, it's a perfect example of like how you can trickle down. They're already doing it. If you give them just like from middle school, high school, college type plans to work with it, you've already got these great kids with you. Yeah, I, see I mean, that is the age that, yeah. that, that smarter children than I decide what they can do. So I have a Lego wall downstairs, really just medieval times and city, nothing like what these kids are doing with robotics and combining it in. It's pretty amazing. Uh, Council Member Cornegie, I see you have your hand back up, my friend. You want to start now. I'm sorry, I try my best not to get too deep in the weeds on this, but I, I am concerned if, if you have the breakdown of the, the jobs, are, are they primarily in manufacturing? Because you mentioned, which is absolutely true, that during the pandemic, um, we suffered from, and you guys picked up a lot of the slack, but we suffered from the inability to produce things and turn that around quickly. So I know that uh, manufacturing, but we know that um, there are opportunities on our commercial campuses, especially in Brooklyn, I, I got to you know, stomp for Brooklyn and industry cities and in the Navy Yard, the ability to create light manufacturing that includes everything from scalpels to, P, to PPE. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you have a breakdown of, of, of what actually goes into what bucket and how much goes into each bucket in terms of jobs and manufacturing? So I, I don't have a specific breakdown in terms of percentages or, or numbers to share. I can follow up on that with you afterwards. Um, what I will share, though, and, and this is one of the reasons to make an investment like this uh, for New York City, um, is that our, our calculations estimate a range of different types of skills and different types of jobs. So, um, for example, there may be what you'd expect for scientists and uh, doctors in life sciences, but there are also, and myself included uh, from experience, there are many, many jobs in business, in manufacturing, in operations, um, and then there's a halo effect to the neighborhoods that um, life sciences clusters um, sit within. Um, and if, if you look at the, the recent economic downturns, um, whether that's this past one that we were in or back in 2009, um, across life sciences, the industry weathers that storm uh, more resiliently. And so that's something where we want to make sure we're investing both for the health of New York City, but also uh, for the opportunity for economic resiliency. We know those two are, are, are just totally intertwined, the, both the health and the economic opportunity. And, and just lastly, um, when I thought of uh, life sciences, I certainly thought about the, the fight that we have around resiliency in our waterfronts, around reducing our carbon footprint, around all of those kinds of things, and certainly uh, alternative energy. Um, uh, does that fall into this life science model as well? So I think where there are direct applications of biology and technology, it would, it would certainly overlap. Um, I, I think that there's 
um, at EDC, we have a number of different um, industry pillars. Um, and we also have, um, as part of that, focus on, on various different environmental and sustainable cities efforts. Um, and so if there's more information that you'd like on, on the effort from EDC for that, we'd certainly be happy to follow up. Yeah, I, I mean, um, I, I, uh, in another life, I'm hoping to be able to create a resiliency plan for our waterfronts as a maritime city and as a maritime borough. And I just wondered if, uh, and I always wondered where I'd get that money from it, but if it's already available uh, through your programming, that would, that would be pretty awesome. See that? Well, we, we linked it right to you, Council Member Corning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been, I've been sitting trying not to do this, Chair, but I, I, have, to, I have to ask. Listen, well, it's, will, you've got great visions for your borough, my friend. Yeah, yes, sir. and I will tell you, waterfront resiliency is not my personal area of expertise, but I, I do know that EDC uh, feels it's, it's incredibly important as well. So we, we can certainly follow up offline on that. Th thank you so much. Thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. Perfect. Uh, and guys, maybe we could just kind of, because we're, we're coming up to your hour, I don't want to keep you too much longer. You mentioned the Pandemic Response Institute. So is, is that something that's going to be out of an actual building? Is that going to be a larger scale? So it's going to link the different campuses together. Um, you know, there's always a little creeping in the back of all of our heads. What if something happens again? How will we pivot and do it differently and better? So, so when I hear something like this, it gives you a little bit of hope that you are taking those steps now because it would be naive to think that there won't be something else coming down the road. It's just, it's just something always seems to come these days. So if we prepare for it. So what, what is this vision? What's actually invested to it? And how do you see the Pandemic Response Institute? So um, I don't know if you heard me take a deep breath, as you said, I hope this never happens again. I, I also hope this never happens again. Um, unfortunately, with climate change and with um, the, the circumstances uh, that led to COVID, for example, I, I hope it never happens again, but we can't act as if it definitely won't. And so it is really imperative for this city um, to make sure that we're bringing together um, the various agencies, the various uh, both public and private sector actors, the community business organizations, um, and, and taking our, our time now um, and focusing on learning from our previous pandemics uh, and including COVID-19 um, and really focusing on how to stem uh, health emergencies and, and make sure that we are um, more integrated into the community and bringing forward um, connectivity and data and trust uh, as part of that um, as we move forward. And so the Pandemic Response Institute um, is meant to address those issues, whether that's uh, for for making sure communities have what they need and being connected for um, being on the forefront of innovation. Um, you know, I think back to last year as EDC was helping stand up uh, supply chain for test kits and, and a lab for, for COVID testing. Um, that's not necessarily what you'd expect members of EDC to do. Um, and so we, we hope that having a Pandemic Response Institute um, will put in place a more, um, a more dedicated uh, team uh, that's a commitment across the public and the private sector um, to be better ready, to be better prepared, and then um, if and when something does happen in the future, to be able to act very quickly um, to minimize how, how long the impact of that pandemic might have on the city. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to comment too much on the specific um, setup of the Institute because we're in the middle of the procurement and we've received some really incredible responses to it. Um, that we are in, in the review of now. Um, but we do anticipate it to have a physical presence and to have a robust network. Um, and I'd, I'd love to take this opportunity to give um, some really great credit to our partners at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, to the New York City Emergency Management Team um, for coming together with us and thinking about how can we engage together as a city, uh, as, as the government actors with the city, but also with our community business partners and the private sector um, to bring this forward. So do you have general timeline of what you vision that might look like, or at least to conceptually think what that would look like in the near future? Oh, sure, sure. I, I mean, we are, um, I will, I, we've moved very fast. Uh, you know, the, the procurement was um, released uh, within the past few months. The deadline for submissions um, was on June 4th, and we're, we've just started reviewing those proposals. We anticipate making a contingent award uh, with $20 million of city capital or up to $20 million of city capital um, by the end of the summer. And we actually expect the Institute um, to be 
um, putting activities forward, at least virtually at the very beginning before the end of this year. Do you see that occupying existing space or do we have to create a new building? For uh, it will really depend on the proposal. The proposals each have their own uh, flavor to them of what well, I mean, we don't, we don't need an actual build. I mean, you already have the people and the folks already who pivoted post pandemic to do this already. So if something were God forbid to happen sooner rather than later, we are already prepared because you already did it. Um, and I'd have to say that whole interagency cooperation has been something I've been clamoring about for eight years. And it always comes from one hearing to the next. Oh, this agency does that. So when you, when you already incorporate that, that makes us happy. You're already Great. working. So with that, I thank our, I thank you guys for, for being, uh, giving us this great information. This is, these are the good news that city needs in these times. And I think, like I said, we have a responsibility to do a little bit better in passing that word on and giving that hope in this time that's happening. This is exactly what we need in the post pandemic world, how this city will continue to rebound. I know we have some panels that have been waiting to go. So I'm gonna turn it back over to our committee chair and council uh, for Alex to take us through that. So Susan and Carlos and your team, as always, thank you for your questions and answers today. Thank you, Chair Vallone and everyone. Thank you, Chair Vallone. Uh, we will now turn to the public testimony portion of the hearing. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike in our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and we will call on you in the order you raised your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to invite Moraes Brown to testify. After Moraes Brown, I will be calling on Samuel Sia, followed by James Flynn. Moraes Brown, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hello, I'm Moraes Brown. I'm a biochemistry PhD student at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx and currently interning as an analyst at Hibiscus BioVentures, a position I obtained through the LifeSite NYC internship program. I'd like to thank the City Council for welcoming me today, as well as the New York City Econo Economic Development Corporation for launching and supporting the internship program. Thank you, Carlo and Sue, as well as the rest of LifeSite NYC team. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, attending Brooklyn Technical High School, followed by Florida International University. I was thrilled to return home to New York City to attend Einstein. For a long time, I felt that the way to have the largest impact on eliminating or, or at least stymieing modern diseases was through scientific hard work by my own hands. This led to my decision to pursue a PhD in biochemistry. Along my scientific journey, I became inspired by non-scientists like Elon Musk in the energy sector and Ken Frazier at Merck, who have made impacts in their respective STEM fields without being the scientists themselves. Their work made me realize that for my own goals, contributing to global improvement in health doesn't necessarily mean creating the effective drug. Expertise in other areas such as business development, market research, and marketing are necessary for that successful drug to have its largest global impact. I feel like LifeSite NYC recognizes this as well and seeks to provide interns with the opportunities needed to, the, to develop these skills. As a science student, there are well-marked pathways that guide one towards medical school or to pursue the research path via a PhD. However, at any level of science education, it is not always clear how to pursue other pathways within the life science industry or even what many of those alternate pathways might be. The Life Science NYC internship program Time addresses expired. this issue by providing New York City students with one place where they can learn about opportunities at dozens of companies, many of them startups that would otherwise be under the radar. Then via a simple, single application, students can apply for these positions via a centralized process. I would not have known about most of the opportunities listed by the program without this setup, and these companies would not have known how to find me either. 
Having gained my internship through the program, I have also had the opportunity to attend this three-day boot camp where I met and connected with many of the other 120 plus students participating in the program this summer and heard from industry leaders who presented on a range of important topics. I feel that participating in this internship program, I will develop a much more well-rounded skill set in my ultimate pursuit to eradicate the worst of the diseases affected humanity, and I will get to do that here in New York City. Thank you for supporting LifeSite NYC. Wow, soon to be Dr. Brown. Uh, you just made this whole hearing worthwhile, my friend. That is exactly what we wanted to hear. So Thank congratulations you. to you. So if I were to deputize you today and say, okay, Marias, you're gonna, you're gonna run this program and make it better or expand it. What, what, do you, what, do you, what would you like to see for the next steps of this program? Because this is the team that's on today that can make that happen. And, and as you can see, we want to expand this to as many students as possible when it's, when it's there. That's a good question because when I, I was actually looking for an internship, I had it in my brain. And so I sought out, I did a Google search myself. So it, I think maybe the advertisement to, like, for example, when I went to tech, I wasn't really, I, I didn't know directly what, what I would want to be. Like, I didn't know I want to be a scientist, but if this was like on a poster or like, um, the 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 school posted over the intercom or something that I was aware of, it, it would have made my planning much more streamlined, even though I found my way eventually. And that could be a big improvement, like just getting the word out in a more efficient manner. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there's, I think there's such a great template for the growth of this, but I think we've got, we're, we're missing some of those on the, on the street, on the school type, details that we can bring that information out to the students um, and the principals and you know it, it's not really shouldn't be the student's responsibility to search and find it. it should be our responsibility to get it to you and then give you that clearer path especially now right as things change mm -hmm. so what what grade do you think would be best impacted to, to start seeing these opportunities what age do you think would be best I would think junior year of high school because at Brooklyn Tech does something unique where they kind of model their system based on the college system where your junior and senior years, you do, you have a, a major quote unquote. So that's really when we kind of the age where us high school students decide, we really start thinking about who we want to be when we, you know, get, get out there into the real world. And I think that's the stage we kind of have an idea of the type of work we want to do that an internship that we'd want to apply to. You know what, Marais, I, and I thank you for spending the time and waiting. I'd love to follow up with you today. you got these two great teams in our office, City Council and EDC and Susan and Carl, his whole team. So maybe that's something when uh, all the semesters are done and the calm of the summer, we can think about how to grow this for this fall and the spring, um, especially with the new investments that are coming in. I'd love to talk to you more if that's okay. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you for coming today. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, next up is Samuel Sia, followed by James Flynn and Ben Dubin Thaler. Samuel Sia, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. He starts now. And I'm just going to jump in, Samuel. I, Council Member Keith Powers, is going to be uh, closing out the hearing, one of our committee members, also for that. So thank you, everybody, for this great hearing. I see Keith Powers smiling, ready to go. So uh, ready. for the yeah. For the, for the following folks who are going to testify, Councilmember Powers will guide you. God bless everyone. Have a good summer day. Thank you, Chair. I you start Chair. now. Well, good afternoon, Chair Ballone and Councilman Powers, members of the committee. My name is Sam Sia. I'm the founder of Harlem Biospace. Harlem Biospace is an NYC EDC sponsored initiative that opened its doors in 2013 as a shared lab incubator in New York City. At the time, there was a lack of commercial lab space for startup companies, uh, even in Manhattan at that time, almost no affordable commercial lab space. Because of NYC EDC support, we opened up the space to allow innovative companies to pursue their ideas at an affordable rate of less than $1,000 per month. We opened up to a full roster of companies on day one, and we've been full over the last eight years of operation. We're proud to have incubated over 60 biotech companies that have raised many millions of dollars in investment. We've also worked with community leaders in Harlem and in all five boroughs to bring STEM to K-12 students from underrepresented backgrounds. 
including a high school program in collaboration with Columbia University that has welcomed students from all five boroughs, uh, STEM programs to over 600 students in NYC DOE classrooms, a program for elementary school girls called Hypothesis Sisters, and currently bringing a science club to residents of NYCHA housing in the outer boroughs with a focus on Staten Island, where we have seen low representation of applicants to our high school maker program. Today, not everyone's aware, but New York City is an international pillar in basic research in life sciences. I have worked with Sue, Carlo, and the NYC EDC life sciences team over the last eight years, and have seen their incredible efforts to open up to more commercial lab spaces, attract investors to the city. But there are still important gaps, such as growth spaces for medium-sized biotech companies and mechanisms to share ideas and infrastructure across research centers. Biotech innovation is happening at a fast and furious pace. It's a large and growing component, a component of tomorrow's economy. New York City has all the ingredients, intellectual, people, capital, and growing structure to be the number one life science in the city in the world. Thank you. Thank you. The next role you're doing with uh, public education and just the economy here in New York City. Thank you, Mr. Sia. Uh, seeing no council member hands raised, we'll move on to the next panelist. Uh, next up, we have James Flynn from Deerfield Management, followed by Ben Dubin Thaler and Ari Espinal. Mr. Flynn, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you today and share how Deerfield Secure is helping to drive New York City's ascent in healthcare innovation. Deerfield has been advancing healthcare through investment, information, and philanthropy for more than 25 years. Today, because of our strong partnership with EDC and folks like Sue have been amazing, the Cure, New York City's new multidisciplinary healthcare innovation campus, was made possible. The flexible real estate of the Cure is more than just a physical space to collaborate. It empowers innovators through state-of-the-art technology and extensive programming. As examples, it fosters interactions to support nascent companies, provides professional development and opportunities to learn for entrepreneurs and managers, and cultivate synergies between large and small healthcare companies. Each floor at the Cure is lab ready and digitally cabled in order to support all types of healthcare focused companies. And with these 12 floors, including the collaboration residency, a space where we all come together, the Cure has the capacity for at least 80 companies. We are truly bringing together innovators across academia, government, private and not-for-profit organizations, scientists, engineers, patients, students and researchers within one campus to achieve the singular mission of enabling everyone to lead a healthier life. The Cure has five classrooms, which can convert into a large hybrid enabled conference space, large enough for almost 500 people, and will provide an egalitarian learning environment where one can be in the far Bronx or Brooklyn and have the same experience as sitting in the room. Through our program programming, women will feel heard and supported through initiatives like Break Into the Boardroom and Women in Science, programs committed to addressing the gender gap in life science. And the collective diversity of the healthcare, healthcare ecosystem will be adapted to reflect New York City's own population through programs like the Deerfield Fellows Program and companies such as Humanity Health. I'll finish up real quick here. With the CURE's unique structure of integrating all stakeholders in one ecosystem, it can create unique opportunities for not-for-profit healthcare organizations to benefit from state-of-the-art technology. For example, Deerfield Catalyst, the Cure's for-profit medtech incubator, will support Cobicure, a public charity focused on developing children's cardiovascular devices that would not normally be able to make it to market. We have a lofty goal with a powerful mission. During the next decade, we will create a life science and healthcare ecosystem based in New York City, which will ed educate more than 100,000 people and include more than 500,000 members. With all this, Cure startups and stakeholders are enabled to turn their ideas and hard work into products and services that serve a collective purpose to end disease. Thank you. Thank you. And I didn't get the, uh, I meant to ask you, where, where, what's the uh, location of the Cure? We're at 345 Park Avenue South. 345, okay. 
You're right out of my district, but that's okay. Uh, good location. And and just the the status of that, I, it sounded like you were talking prospectively. So that is coming online or you are? Yes. So we have been building furiously uh, during the pandemic. Um, we have uh, a couple of floors that are operational. We're just starting to build out the first labs. The collaboration residency where a lot of the great stuff will occur will be open around September. And uh, additional collaboration spaces on the roof, additional lab space uh, will be complete towards the end of the year. Got it. Is there any reason for that exact location? Is it or is it uh, uh, existing space that you decide to convert, or is there any other sort of location based uh, for for that for where you are? Yeah, we actually uh, looked very extensively uh, in Long Island City. We looked in Brooklyn. We looked in a lot of places, and because we are converging a lot of stakeholders and have uh, relationships with, for example, uh, Columbia, Cornell, Rockefeller, Memorial Stone Kettering, a lot of the academic organizations that um, uh, from which the intellectual property comes, uh, we needed to be at some place where everyone could converge. So um, when we found the availability of this of this property, it seemed to, to fit that, that bill. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, good. Well, thank, thank you for testifying and uh, good luck and hope to see you guys get off the ground. Appreciate you uh, testifying here today. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Uh, next up will be Ben Dubin Thaler, followed by Ari Espinal and then Nancy Kelly. Uh, Mr. Dubin Thaler, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Dear council members, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak uh, in support of the LifeSci NYC internship program. Um, LifeSci NYC has been instrumental in Biobus's efforts. I'm the founder and executive director of Biobus, the science education nonprofit. Uh, LifeSci NYC has been instrumental in our efforts to create a more diverse and inclusive life sciences community and ultimately a more equitable life sciences economy like we've been discussing uh, in this hearing. Uh, we've had 26 uh, college students in the program since 2018, and we focus, five of us focuses on students that have fewer education and research opportunities, and the supermajority of our students are students of color. Um, LifeSci NYC interns have completed sophisticated research projects, solidifying their own identities as scientists. Um, they've honed their entrepreneurial skills through their work at Biobus. Um, one student in particular, Busayo, uh, exemplifies this work. She designed and implemented uh, a rigorous series of experiments that revealed how ants and tenai work. Um, and Busayo overcame many challenges uh, during her work at Biobus through the Life Science NYC program. Uh, her queen ant died twice. Um, she confronted the ethics of experimentation on ants, uh, to which she had actually grown quite attached. Uh, Bosayo later told us that facing those challenges um, with support, but also independence from her mentors at Biobus gave her the confidence and skills to truly consider herself a scientist. This kind of transformation is common in, in, in our program. Uh, a key indicator is that 96% of our former interns responding to a survey uh, have remained on a science career path. Um, and uh, as we've discussed, um, uh, you know, it's a pathway. Uh, our interns also help work with the 50,000 young scientists that uh, come to Biobus's other programs uh, through our partnerships with DOE and DYCD. Um, and uh, finally, they also help run public events where we are um, uh, providing people young, old, in-person, online, in all five boroughs uh, with uh, inspiration uh, to join. Time expired. With inspiration to join New York's thriving and growing life science community. So, thank you. Hey. YC, and thank you for your time. Appreciate it. And, and just so for clarification, Bi Biobus is a mobile lab. Is that what it is? Or what's the. Yeah, we have two mobile labs. We're not just a bus, though. Um, we also have brick and mortar labs in partnership with Columbia University and also on the Lower East Side. And we're, uh, we actually just received city council funding to expand to Queens. Got it. Where are you in the Lower East Side? Um, well, we're uh, uh, partnering with schools all across the Lower East Side, including East Side Community High School, uh, PS34, um, and we've been to pretty much every school in District 1. Got it. Okay, appreciate it. I see Councilmember Barron has a question, so we can uh, get to her. So we get you, Councilmember Barron, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I was listening because I was attending to some other matters, and I heard the panelists mention the bio bus. And I've had direct experience with them 
about maybe three or four years ago at our Juneteenth program, we had the bio bus come and it was parked outside of the uh, venue where we were having our event. And we encouraged the community to go onto the bio bus and visit and see the exhibits that they had and see the work. So I'm glad to have a specific example and one that was uh, quite relevant and quite appropriate and quite exciting and to know that that's a part of the funding uh, that this program is doing. So I wanna support that, acknowledge the great involvement uh, and we look forward to continuing to have the bio bus come to events in our district and encourage people to participate. Thank you. Well, thank you, Councilor Barron, and uh, appreciate adding context and, uh, and support for that. Um, thank you Thanks for your testimony and uh, we'll head over to the next uh, panelist now, thanks. Thank you, council members. Uh, next up, we will hear from Ari Espinal, followed by Nancy J. Kelly and George James. Ari Espinal, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Chair Vallone and Councilman Powers for the opportunity to testify before this committee. I'm testifying on behalf of the Construction and General Building Laborers Local 79 to express our strong support for the growth and development of life sciences industry as part of NYC economic recovery. Local 79, which serves the five boroughs, has over 10,000 active and retired members and is the largest laborers local in North America. We believe our city will benefit from an industry poised to create tens of thousands of good paying jobs that that CUNY students, young people, and New Yorkers from disadvantaged backgrounds can be trained for. In addition, as you know, this industry creates life-saving cures and treatments for diseases. That's why we support development projects focused on growing the life sciences industry, which can also improve the health of NYC communities by building with union jobs that provide family health benefits. One key life sciences development project city government should fully support is Center East, the plan expansion to re renovate New York Blood Center on East 67th Street. The New York Blood Center is the leading supplier of blood to area hospitals, has worked for decades on life-saving cures and treatments for sickle cell and other diseases impacting Black New Yorkers and other New Yorkers of color. The development partner Longfellow is a top life science developer committee to thoughtful, inclusive development, building with union labor and creating jobs for New Yorkers of colors and low-income households. They have committed to working with Local 79 to ensure local residents from disadvantaged communities have access to careers both in union construction and life sciences sector. Opponents of this project complain that the new people will crowd their space. We think that people like our members, New Yorkers of colors, public housing, residents and immigrants looking to work in the Upper East Side medical quarter or simply to seek medical care should Time be- expired not kept and excluded. Sensor East can boost wages for Red East Harlem, South Bronx, Queensbridge, and other neighborhoods hit hard by COVID. City government cannot afford to allow opposition from wealthy elites to stand in the way of thousands of family sustaining jobs for communities, life-saving cures and treatments. Thank you for the opportunity and um, for me to express our support. Thank you. Nice to see you, Ari Espinal, and I hope you are doing well. Thank you for the testimony and uh, all your work on behalf of uh, New Yorkers and working New Yorkers here. So I uh, appreciate it. And I, I like your, your Leona shirt there as well. Uh, all right. Well, uh, thank, thanks so much. We'll go to the next uh, panelist. Thank you, Council Member. Next, we'll hear from Nancy J. Kelly, followed by George James, and then Maria Gotch. Nancy Kelly, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hi, Councilman Powers and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Kelly, and I'm a founding member of NYC Builds Bio. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. NYC Builds Bio is a nonprofit whose mission is to bring the life science and real estate communities together in order to foster a growing life science cluster in New York, such as those found in Boston and San Francisco. At a moment when the importance of developing life science infrastructure has been made starkly clear by the COVID pandemic, it is critically important that New York continues to invest in its capacity to support this growing industry. This global crisis has demonstrated the importance of laboratory space and life science and biotech research 
to develop timely, effective vaccines, but also the potential for biotech to solve many of the planetary problems associated with climate change and other things. 2020 was a pivotal year for life science in New York City and in the global market as the industry continuously rose to the challenges at this critical juncture in our history. Two of New York's leading biotech pharma companies, Pfizer and Regeneron, led the way to new vaccines and therapeutics for COVID-19. Pfizer launched the Pfizer Breakthrough Growth Initiative with a $500 million commitment to funding new breakthroughs. The company joined a host of private equity firms that raised or committed over $6 billion to invest in biotech research and companies post-pandemic. Several New York cities, such as Schrodinger, Black Diamond Therapeutics, AI Analytics, and Nuvation Bio were among those completing IPOs last year, and a record number of New York companies raised substantial rounds of private equity during the pandemic, including C16 Biosciences, Calliope, Redpin Therapeutics, Compass I'm Pathways, Immune and Elevation Oncology. Though this hearing is focused on life sciences in New York City in general, I would like to take a moment to speak on the New York Blood Center's proposal, which would provide significant additional space for institutional partners and biotechnology firms. This project is a tremendous opportunity for the life science infrastructure here in our city. Needless to say, the Blood Center plays a critical role, not only in New York's life sciences industry, but our national healthcare ecosystem, supplying blood to millions of people and serving as a hub for life-saving life biological research. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the importance of the life sciences industry to the future of New York City and voice my support for the New York Blood Center's essential project and for New York City's continued investment in life sciences. Thank you, thanks for the testimony. Um, and we'll now head to, I think, George James, thanks. That's correct, Council Member. George James, followed by Maria Gotch and George Infinite. Mr. James, you may begin with the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. My name is George James. I'm an urban planner. In 2016, New York City had a problem. Investing in life sciences was a priority, but zoning for life science research labs was use group 17, which is an industrial land use, which made them very hard to cite. Consequently, Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn had a memo produced that effectively changed research labs to use group nine, allowing them in most commercial districts. Also in 2016, the Department of Health changed the health code to require that the research labs register because quote, the department is concerned that an accident at a New York City based high containment research laboratory could have catastrophic consequences, unquote. This year, I foiled that listing of registered research laboratories. Department of Health rejected the foil because, quote, to release the names and addresses of these facilities would constitute an untenable security risk. So on one hand, New York City is making these uses easier to cite, saying they can co-locate co with residences and elementary schools. While on the other hand, New York City is saying that these facilities are too dangerous to even disclose and an accident could cause catastrophic consequences. Now, I don't know a lot about this industry, but I do know that we do not make land use policy by decree. I also know that citing a facility that could cause catastrophic harm alongside sensitive uses is land use malpractice. Deputy Mayor Glenn's memo changing where these facilities may be cited was improper. While the DOB interprets zoning, if they wanna change their 50 year interpretation, that's changing law. And if an agency wants to change law, they must involve the city council. Considering the potential of catastrophic consequences, I hope council will require the administration to go back and follow our land use process. Thank you. Thanks, George. Nice to see you. And uh, thanks for the testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. James. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Maria Gotch, followed by George Infinite and Nadja Barlera. Ms. Gotch, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. 
Good afternoon. I'm very excited to be here to testify about life sciences, which we believe is one of the great potential growth sectors of the New York City economy, particularly coming out of COVID. Um, we have had a longstanding partnership with the city, EDC, Sue and her team, to uh, try to make this uh, belief a reality. And we have put our money where our mouth is. We've invested over 40% of our fund in various investments to support the growth of life sciences in New York. Uh, we've been tracking uh, the growth of the sector and uh, when it comes to employment, business formation, and gross city product or economic output, the numbers over the last five years since the city made its investment are all up uh, and they're up, uh, they're up relative to where the, the overall city economy is. And in particular, New York City has done a very good job of attracting investment capital. And that's really a key thing because it's the investment capital into individual companies that allows those companies to create jobs and supports the internship program that we're all uh, think is so important to the city. So uh, the 19, sorry, in, two, in 2020, the city attracted $2.3 billion of venture capital. That's up three times from the number the year before. And that money is all going to support uh, entrepreneurs, companies uh, that are in New York City. And how the city is thinking about the, the future growth and the current proposal uh, to do $500 million is really about making an investment in the two sides of the equation. The money to support the growth of real estate is an investment in the industry. It's not supporting an individual company, but it's building the infrastructure that multiple companies can use over the coming years to grow their companies, do their uh, research within their wet lab space. And then the internship program, which we've heard a lot about, we think is critical for bringing and making sure that a wide variety of people in New York have access to a job. Uh, so we think in general, a very well-crafted plan by the city to support slide. life sciences. And then just final word that the city's investment is within the context of other groups coming to support the industry. The state has made a big commitment. We've invested in a life sciences uh, incubator program called IndieBio, which every year is in bringing and supporting 20 companies. And we believe that will be an important engine to support both the real estate that's being built and also to create jobs and potential internships that the, uh, the city is paying for. So we think again, to conclude, uh, life sciences has great prospects and we think will be a big growth sector for the city post COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony and uh, your work here to uh, help and make investments and uh, promote life sciences here in New York City as well. Hope you're doing well. We'll go to the uh, next panelist. Thank you, council members. Thank you, Ms. Gotch. Next, we'll hear from George Infinite followed by Nadja Barlera and Martin Bell. Mr. Infinite, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. It starts now. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before this committee. My name is Infinite George, and I'm a member of Local 79. I'm here to express my strong support for the growth and development of life science industry. <clears throat> As a lifelong New Yorker who grew up in public housing, I believe our city would benefit in tens of thousands of good paying career opportunities for New Yorkers from disadvantaged areas um, and life-saving cures and treatments for diseases. One key life science project city council will fully support is the city east, um, the expansion and innovation of the New York Blood Center on East 67th Street. The New York Blood Center is the leading supplier of the blood for the area hospitals in New York and the development cure and the treatments for sickle cell and other diseases impacting Black New Yorkers and New Yorkers of color. In addition, its public health mission, this project will generate thousands of construction jobs with area standard wages and benefits to support workers and their families. The development partner Longfellow is committed thoughtfully, inclusive development building with union labor and creating jobs for New Yorkers of color and low income households, both union construction and in the life science sector. Opponents of this project are complaining about the people crowding their neighborhood. Like many local 79 members, I grew up in Queensbridge housing in Long Island City, just across the bridge from the proposed center. I hope that people like me looking for, looking for work in the Upper East Side medical corridor or simply seek medical care on the, on the center east can boost wages for our Queensbridge residents and residents of East Harlem, South Bronx, and other neighbors hit hard by COVID. The city government 
cannot afford to allow opposition from wealthy elites to stand in the way of thousands of families sustaining jobs for our community and life-saving treatment. Thank you again for the opportunity to suppress my support. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. George. Next, we will hear from Nadja Barlera and then Martin Bell. As a reminder, if you still wish to testify but have not heard your name called, uh, please raise your hand in the Zoom chat. Thank you very much. Mr. Barlera, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm here to testify on behalf of the Greater New York Laborers Employers Cooperation and Education Trust um, in support of the life sciences industry. Um, Greater New York Lesset is a jointly managed trust fund of the Mason Tenders District Council of Greater New York. In New York City, we represent 17,000 hardworking men and women in construction and 1,200 signatory contractors. I just wanna echo what some other folks have said. Um, the life, we wanna advocate for a life science sector that will not only work on science sector in internships and life-saving treatments, but will also contribute to the health of our communities by building with union labor that provides family sustaining health benefits and family sustaining wages. Again, wanna echo what folks have said about supporting a key project, which is Blood Center East um, on East 67th Street. Um, the developer is committed to working with Local 79 on local hire, to being thoughtful and inclusive in the neighborhood and building with union jobs and creating career opportunities for our members and for new internship opportunities and apprenticeship opportunities for, for new people. Um, we hope that you know the Upper East Side would welcome people like our members who are largely immigrants of, and people of color and that our members would also benefit from the life-saving treatments and cares that the Blood Center works on. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, thanks for the testimony. Thank you. And now our final panelist um, will be Mr. Bell. Mr. Bell, you may be, Martin Bell, you may begin when the sergeant's call time. Time starts now. Hi, my name's Marty Bell. I support life science. I work in life science, but I'm violently opposed to one proposed project you've already heard about, which is attempting to use life science bandwagon as a Trojan horse to get approved. I'm talking about the blood centers proposed 334 foot mid block tower on a narrow side street opposite a school in a park. As this committee knows, life science hubs can and should go in many locations, but not in every location. And the blood center site on East 67th Street is perhaps the worst possible site. It is directly opposite Julia Richmond Educational Complex, which is six schools, including one school for children with autism with 2000 students drawn from every city council district throughout the city. That school, that school complex currently enjoys, as you know, uh, council member Powers, you were there at the rally. It enjoys bright sunshine all day long. This tower would put it in permanent darkness. It is opposed by every principal and every teacher and every student in that school. You can't be for school children and support the blood center project. It's not possible. Is the blood center would, is, is also across from the park, which, uh, and the tower would put most of that park in, in shadows all afternoon when it's most used by local seniors and um, families with school aged children. I would ask that this council qualify its support of life science hubs by requiring that they take into account the direct impact on the neighborhood in which the project's being proposed and the sentiment of the local community. You, let me repeat, repeat again, you can't support and be in favor of school children and support the Blood Center project. It's just not possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Thanks to see. Uh, seeing no additional hands raised uh, at this time, once more, I'll just like to say if your name has not been called and you still wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no additional hands raised, I will turn it to uh, Acting Chair Councilmember Powers for closing remarks. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. And we've heard a lot of uh, different examples and I think thoughts and ideas around the growth of the life science industry, uh, here in the future, and I think we will recognize its place and importance in our long-term economic growth here. 
So I want to appreciate thank you to the EDC and everyone who came to testify here today to talk about uh, what is the future, where, how, and what's the role relative to New Yorkers here, particularly in our education system. So I want to, thanks to they say thank you to all the staff from the Economic Development Committee here at the Council. Thanks to the EDC. Thanks to everyone for being here today. And with that, uh, now I'm not here for alone, but I will uh, close the hearing out. And thanks everyone for being here. Well, that's me gaveling out. Bye, guys. Thanks so much.